this week on Arts Insight. Really, really good handcrafted food. The introduction of food to the table makes it more alive and sort of an instant in time. A true television pioneer. I can't sit here feeling as I do and regret one minute of any minute in my past. Music bridging the gap between nations. I think that music is the way to the people. An old building housing new creativity. It's really fun to see how they took something that you know, typically may have been discarded and now it's a piece of art. I'm Ernie Manoos and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Let's get the holidays started off right. We're at the home of Houston Ballet in their costume shop, about to get a sneak peek at some of the festive gifts coming this season from the theater district. But first, a tasty treat for your eyes only. From oven brown chickens to plum pudding, one artist is dishing out some culinary delights with zero calories. late 80s, 1980s, Bio Ben wanted to do something more to stimulate people coming through the house instead of a plain museum setting. The introduction of food to the table makes it more alive and sort of an instant in time. So you have to go back and look at how food was done, what foods were made, the different recipes, how food has evolved. And so I got into doing that my name is Henry Gadbois, and I'm a faux food artist. Faux food, or fake food, as some people call it, is just an imitation of the real object. Because in historic houses, you couldn't possibly use real food and all that expensive furniture that, that they have. So you use the artificial food, and I called it faux food. I've been creating the faux food arts since about 19. 88, 89. Well, it was because BioBen needs some of the faux foods to decorate, especially at the Christmas season. So that's what really started me. So you supply them with what they need, and then it, it just keeps going on, and especially as different museums want different objects. For instance, the boiled tongue is a very popular object because people come in and go, ah! and you know they're repulsed by it but this makes it more alive and i can't think of anything else that repulses people but it's fun the first thing i made was i think a coffin pastry this is something that they would make a heavy paste with a lid and it would be decorated it would be out of pastry and then they would fill it with things like one time i've read a recipe where it's a whole chicken it's inside of a chicken and then pieces on top and then it's served that way. My biggest seller are oysters, and I use the real shell, and then I press the clay into each shell so that it is unique to that shell. And then I fire the piece of clay, and then I paint it, and then I put it in the shell, and then I pour it with a clear resin so it looks like the juice of the oyster. It's clay, it's just mud. That's why our garage is so dirty with the, the casting. If you take a real object and you make a little plastic box, correct size for it, I pour it with plaster of Paris and I dip the object in halfway. And then when the plaster starts setting up, in each corner you sort of dig a little hole so it's a match then when you pour the top. You let the plaster set up and then you oil it so that the new plaster will not stick to it. And then you cover it up with plaster and you wait for it to dry. You undo the plastic box, you take it out, and you pry the two pieces apart. So, I mean, that's the whole process. Of course, when you get it assembled, you paint it. Then it's finished. Just doing it, it's keeping you busy. It's a creative process, really, and it's fun to do. It is always nice when people look at your food. 
I've even had friends that know I make the faux food, and he picked up a piece of candy to bite one time and actually bit it before he realized he had picked up the wrong object. So it's fun. Not that I enjoy fooling people, but it's nice when I do. You can find out more by visiting hgfaufoods.com. And it's the holiday season right around the corner, so we're in the theater district to find out all the fun and exciting things that are going to be going on this season. To tell us more is the CEO of Theater District Houston, Catherine McNeil. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Ernie. Welcome to the theater district. So I bet you're excited. I'm very excited. I'm flying angels. Flying angels? <laughs> flying angels and Christmas trees. So every year, Theater District brings in a lot of people into the city of Houston and in our city already coming to theater. How, how big of a financial impact does this have on the city? Uh, it's a lot for the restaurants, just from parking, tickets, staying in hotels. So and beyond just the tickets themselves, absolutely. it has a huge impact. Absolutely. It has a huge impact. So we have a lot of different organizations involved in the theater district. Which are? I'm going to make you do the list. There's seven of them. Okay. We're in the ballet school in their costume department. So you have the ballet, the symphony, the opera, the alley, Society for the Performing Arts, the Camera, and Theater Under the Stars. Ah, okay. So they all are looking at giving us a wonderful holiday season. They are. They each have something planned. What are you most excited about? Well, we have two world premieres, which is really exciting. Here at the ballet, we have Stanton Welch's world premiere of The Nutcracker. Okay, before we go any further, The yes. Nutcracker, it's been going for how many years here? Well, Ben Stevenson's was for 29 years. So we've got a new production This of is Nutcracker. a new one, Stanton Welch's new one. There, uh, the British designer uh, designed 282 individual new costumes for this wow. Nutcracker. Uh, they use more students from the school in this one. And a new exciting set, too, I hear. Yes. I can't wait to yes. see that. So that's happening at the ballet. What's happening at the opera? The world premiere of It's a Wonderful Life. Of the old movie. So, of the old movie. And so it's going to be told uh, through the eyes of the angel, Clara. Okay, and over in the newly renovated and remodeled Alley Theater, they brought back two favorite classics. Yes, they have. For the devil in you, there's Santa Land Diaries, <laughs> and then there's always the Christmas Carol. Yeah, truly a perennial favorite here. And the Houston Symphony will have Very Merry Pops, so you can sing all of your favorite Christmas classics. And then right here at the Wortham, because we're right behind the Wortham here at the ballet. Who's going to be lighting the Christmas tree? Uh, I hear maybe I'm going to be lighting the Christmas tree. And you'll be doing that when? I'll be doing it the day before Thanksgiving with Sugar Plum and Santa, and it's just going to be a wonderful event. That's right. And they bring in kids from all over the area to come here. And I think that's so wonderful about our theater district, is not only are we putting on the arts, we're educating people about the arts. Absolutely. And they do that throughout the year. They bring students in from schools, elementary, middle, high school, from throughout the county and the region, and bring them in for performances and tours. So that's year-round. So we get all the thrills of a chilly holiday season, and probably with our Texas weather, we'll be fine to They'll walk be around They'll be snowing theater. outside. Oh, it will be snowing outside. You're guaranteeing it this year? It'll be snowing outside. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Ernie. To find out more about all the going-ons in the Theater District, you can visit their website, theaterdistricthouston.org. Up next, he's responsible for an array of groundbreaking television shows. Writer, director, producer Norman Lear changed the way we watch television. He has been around approximately forever. He is 92 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, Norman Lear. I stay involved because uh, I'm human. I am. There's a lot to do to be a parent. There's a lot to do to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, if you're a serious person, doesn't wake up in the morning without a lot to do, unrelated to a job or anything, just to be a person and to feel you matter. Know, he um, he tries to practice what he preaches. He it believes very much in equality and fairness and honesty. And he cares, and he's, he's vigilant about it. And I find it amazing for as someone that makes documentaries and you know is always trying to get to the sort of core essence of the truth. Someone that lives their life like that is, um, you know, just a joy.
Action. Fella, you ten times the man I was. <laughs> Once more for the boss. Oh, Jesus. Hey, hello. Roy Norman's always in here, man. Okay. Okay, Cash. Okay, good to see you. I can't sit here feeling as I do and regret one minute of any minute in my past. Look, there's only one sensible way out of this. You don't have to have the baby. It's legal now. You no, know, she's right. It's legal in New York State. You better give that a thought. I have given it a thought. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. I think that's only because our humanity has not changed. You know, the problems we were dealing with in the 70s uh, are much the same as, you know, if a woman is suffering menopause, she's suffering menopause. This year, the way she was suffering then. If uh, a young man was suffering impotence because his mind was distracted or whatever, we, we did that show too with Michael. Uh, the problems are the same. The economy is tight. Somebody is worried about losing a job. Nothing has changed. You, humanity is still humanity. You know what I like about you, Archie? What's that, boy? Nothing. <laughs> Playing those roles, with, was a big responsibility. And uh, especially if you're playing an American bigot as Carol O'Connor was. I don't know whether, how much, I know I had less understanding of his difficulties than I did in later years and certainly this late. But I did understand I was dealing with a man who, uh, who didn't know how, he didn't know his own riches as a, as an actor, and especially in that role. We fought all the time. Uh, and he uh, can be seen on television in a number of situations, talking a bit negatively, not, not anything terrible, but talking a bit negatively about me and our relationship. But when he passed, and I went to visit his wife, Nancy, she asked me to wait until the others were gone and when they were gone, she took me into his study, and his desk was bare except for a book or something, and, 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 and one letter. And it was a letter I had written him four or five or six years before, in which I was telling him that despite uh, everything we were going through together, the difficulty of working day by day, week by week, that, uh, that I loved him, you know, that I couldn't be more grateful that there wasn't an Archie until he mouthed the first words. You know you're right, Archie. You're right. The British are a bunch of pansies. Pansies, fairies, and sissies. And the Japanese are a race of midgets. The Irish are boozers. The Mexicans are bandits. And you Polacks are meatheads. <laughs> His first few pictures he would not have made but for the fact that I was there. Nobody saw anything in Princess Bride. Uh, the th the uh, studios, that is. And, uh, I will never forget reading Princess Bride. How could I not have helped? And uh, we were already making the film when uh, when the studio finally came along and said, well, we'll come in too. I was invited to a lunch, a luncheon in San Francisco. There were only three tables. The Dalai Lama was the guest of honor. I was seated next to him at one of three tables. As we sat down, uh, there was a, uh, a, a little bit of lettuce and some baby shrimp in the lettuce. And we had been talking and, and, and uh, suddenly the hostess says we can start eating. I'm eating and I'm talking on this side. And so when I look over to Dalai Lama and he's sitting there and uh, I said, Your Holiness. And he said, Are you interested to know why I'm not eating the shrimp? I said, well, yes. He said, I view them as about 12 beings. And I said, oh, I understand. And so when we talked about whatever. That was, when that was taken away, they brought us a small steak. And again, I was occupied on this side until I looked over and the Dalai Lama is cutting into a steak. And I looked and before I could say, you're all in this, he said, oh, you want to know about the steak? I said, mm -hmm. yes. He said, well, I have three reasons. He said, first, I wouldn't wish to disappoint my hostess and eat nothing. Uh, two, those were 12 sentient, is the word, beings. Uh, this is just one. And three, 
I love steak. <laughs> well, after, it, you know, just has to add time. You know, if lifting weights or running, you know, can add time, God, how laughter can add time. <laughs> Remember, you heard it here. Guys like us, we had it made. No For more, there's a new documentary out about Norman Lear. Check out the American Masters website to find out how you can watch. All right, little known fact, Detroit has a sister city in Japan. For the 55th anniversary of this sisterhood, they celebrated with an international orchestral collaboration. I think that music is the world language to communicate with the people. Detroit at all. Because the city of Toyota and city of Detroit has been a sister city uh, relationship for many years. So that's the kind of uh, occasions uh, to celebrate this type of uh, relationship for years. That's why we decided to come over here. So the hardest part is all, of course, of the music itself. But since this is the 55th anniversary event, so a lot of pressure for Toyota Junior Orchestra, they got it, you know, and they worked very hard to make it, and both worked so much to work on in the very, very detail. So it, it was a tough, tough situation, although we overcome uh, for this event. In my case, this uh, collaboration together took only two days to work to, the, to make it happen. However, I led the performance back in Japan separate for a couple times, of course, uh, with the orchestra members. Then Ken Stanton, uh, who is a conductor of DSO, he put the, his own team to work together. So we have separately worked several months then we combine together just two, two months. Because this is not easy for, both are amateur, not a professional you know, orchestra, but we, it worked very good that way. At the uh, first beginning, of course, they were a little shy, not talk too much about it, but through two days collaboration, they could communicate through the music, just like a friends. So I was very impressed with that. So we started from the two nations' national anthem. Then we played the Tchaikovsky's March Flood. Then we played the, a Japanese a popular song, which is used in animation film, and that's very popular to the, the kids. Then we played the Japanese a beautiful a summer song, kind of folk song. Then we played the double jet, number nine, from the New World as a finale. <laughs> I think it was a great success. And I heard that the orchestra hall of DSO is one of the top acoustically beautiful uh, concert hall in U.S. and one of five. So because of our hard work and also addition to it, the concert hall helped us uh, a lot about audio and sound and it, it, it was fantastic result. When at the first time that I heard about the name of Detroit, we were a bit scared. However, once we are here and we played together with the uh, students and we lived here for a couple of days, we met a lot of people, we, we were in the beautiful concert hall and we had a great time. So I, once we are back to Japan, I would like to explain those kind of experience that we have in Detroit. But I think that there are so many young kids that he brought in, they are first time to come to U.S. or even they are never been outside of Japan. So, uh, but once they are here, they acquired all kinds of experience, meeting people, meeting friends, get the friends, and this type of experience will be very proud of them and also 
that will help them to grow another dimension. We have been supported a lot of people, including of course mayors from both sides, both cities uh, in America, and a lot of people helped us, and we'd like to do it again. I love Detroit. Go to dso.org to find out more. And finally tonight, artists have found a safe haven in a historic building in St. Petersburg, Florida. The Craftsman's House serves as both a creative shelter and as a hub to gather environmental artists to showcase their work. The gallery is housed in an historic 1918 arts and crafts bungalow. It was actually built as a model home for the historic Kenwood neighborhood that sits right behind us. They have the largest concentration of arts and crafts bungalows in the southeast. So it draws, besides art enthusiasts, it'll draw a lot of just, you know, history and architecture enthusiasts also. And of course, with the cafe and the pottery studio, people can come and grab a bite to eat, a coffee in the morning, lunch, and, and it gets the locals in here more often, and of course, the out-of-towners and the tourists. Well, I found myself getting more involved in the community and the, specifically the arts community. As a board member for St. Petersburg Preservation, we strive to keep the important structures here that really give us a sense of place as a community and as a city in St. Petersburg. In my previous job, I traveled quite a bit and I wanted to settle down more and not travel as much and you know enjoy St. Petersburg. So that's how Craftsman House actually was born. Bought the building itself, which was so unique. I saw the building, I was like, that's it. Spent over two years renovating it authentically, and then it now houses the gallery, the cafe, and the old carriage house out back is the working pottery studio. I've been doing ceramics for seven years now. I started in high school, and I just kept going with it, ended up going to college. I double majored in ceramics as well as jewelry. After college, I found this artist residency down here in Florida and so I took that here at the Craftsman House and so here I am. Ceramics is a great medium. You can do anything with it. Um, it's such a malleable substance. Clay can be formed into so many different things, whatever you want. You can do wheel throwing or hand building. It's whatever your imagination can bring you. And clay itself can be recycled too. Like if you mess up on making a pot, you can just add water and it'll decompose and then um, you can evaporate the water and knead it back into a ball of clay and start on the wheel again. And then I'm gonna throw one of my ice cream sundae dishes. So it'll be a little bit different than throwing a typical pot on the wheel. So here I have a credit card that's just cut out. I made a shape for the, the foot, the pedestal of the ice cream dish. And then I'll just gently push out the walls to create form. I love doing detail in my work. I'll alter pieces after they, after I take them off the wheel. I'll add detail and carving and slip trailing. There's a lot of different ways you can add detail to a piece. In my ceramics I use carving. Um, I learned this technique, uh, the traditional Chinese carving technique, when I went to Jingdezhen, China last winter. Uh, I was there for an artist residency for three weeks, so I learned a lot of the traditional decorating carving techniques. Clay 
clay is brought from the earth and we use that to create art as well as using like recycled items which our art for the earth show shows a lot of everything we carry here is handmade by american artists so we represent over 300 artists and in doing that we looked around and we realized we had a lot of eco-friendly artists and that's how the show art from the earth actually got developed and we said, well, let's put these together. And then after the first year, we decided to make it a little more formal and contact artists that carried work that was very eco-friendly or made from recycled, upcycled materials. And then we would invite them to actually make some work specifically for the show. We like to have a wide variety of both uh, pieces in both price range and also in just style. You know, when you look at the Art for the Earth, you'll have something made out of cut up a mosaic made out of cut up junk mail or you'll have uh, pieces made from old army helmets or old tools that all of a sudden become a, a lobster or a, a fun character that was in the artist's mind so it's it's really fun to see how they took something that you know, typically may have been discarded and now it's a piece of art it's really great to see how st petersburg as a city has grown as an arts community and is such a vibrant art scene here now. You know, starting probably with the second Saturday of each month where we have our monthly art walk, but it just continues all month now. It's not just a once a month scene, it's all month every day. St. Petersburg is a great artsy area. Um, I was reading about it before I came down here to the Craftsman House and how it's an up and coming art city. Um, so it's a great way for me to go around the city and experience other forms of art as well as way making work here at the Craftsman House. Um, it's inspirational. You can get more details at craftsmanshousegallery.com. From the costume shop at the Houston Ballet where their elves are hard at work getting the all-new Nutcracker ready, that does it for this edition of Arts Insight. For all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manus. Thanks for watching and have a great week.